Welcome to the Soul Enchilada. I'm Laura Bussey here with the amazing licensed therapist, free counseling, Christine Ruth. This is episode 31. Oh my goodness. I just want to remind you, if you have a question for Christine and I, you can reach us at soulenchilada.com. Send in your question. This question that we're going to tackle today came from your retreat. You just went on last weekend, right? Yeah. Yeah. Laura, I just got back from Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, where I was helping to uh, be a speaker, a educator at a Mom's Hope retreat, which is a, sp a specific retreat for mothers who've lost their children. And yeah, I've, I've just been holding these women in my heart. It was specifically for women and, uh, you know, Sandy and Julie, um, Sandy Perkins and Julie Samuelson, who um, orchestrate this every year free of charge, invited me in and I'm just so touched. And I had a woman come up to me after um, the retreat and she asked a question and I really have been sitting with it. And I thought, you know, this would be such a great question for our podcast. Because I think even though it was coming from a mom who had recently lost a child, I think it's a question that we all might ask, um, whether we're going through a season of loss, uh, a season of change, whether we find out our partner just had an affair, whether we go through a huge move, whether we lose a job, whether our marriage falls apart for whatever reason. Um, you know, we ask questions like this. And here was the question. She said, I just don't know what my purpose is. How do I find my purpose now that my soul has been shattered? How do I go on after losing a child? And her question just stopped me in my tracks because really that's what it is. Um, you know, how do we, when our souls get shattered, I mean, first of all, I can't imagine that kind of shattering. I, I can't imagine that kind of shattering, like what you've gone through, Laura, mm -hmm. uh, what she's going through, what these 20 moms are going through that were at this retreat. Um, but how do we rebuild? How do we find meaning? How do we move forward when our souls have been shattered? And I thought, you know, what a, what a, uh, what a way to start, um, a podcast today. <laughs> yeah. Starting in tears. <laughs> oh, wow. I know. I know. I, my soul has been shattered after losing my son, Evan in 20. 21. He was 23 years old and we thought he was doing great. And then our, my soul was shattered. I, I describe it as, um, the tsunami that hit our family. I describe it as the earthquake that separated my life, my life with Evan on earth. And then this huge chasm that I must walk through to get to the other side, which is life with Evan in heaven. So whew, this, this question hits me. Um, I, I'm even afraid to say it, but I feel like my purpose is going to come out, is coming out of this, of this question. So, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, Laura, I'm just, you know, as you're collecting yourself, you know, I just wanted to tell our listeners, um, I thought it was really amazing that I had just been at this retreat. I was just thinking about it. And a friend of mine, uh, Anjali, sent me, um, and many of you probably listened to it, um, the transcript from Ezra Klein's interview with Jean Twenge. Um, Jean um, is really concerned about um, how the suicide rates and mental health issues among teens have been climbing 
And in the Ezra Klein podcast, and this comes out of the New York Times, I just want to share these statistics. And, and then Laura, you know, I want to hear more from you, but I'm going to give you a moment here. But um, Jean Twenge explains that between 2011 and 2021, the number of teens and young adults in clinical depression more than doubled. Uh, between 2007 and 2019, the suicide rate for those in their early 20s rose by 41%. And the suicide rate for 10 to 14 year olds, 10 to 14 year olds tripled and it nearly quadrupled for girls. Uh, Ezra Klein uh, quotes a CDC survey that found that in 2021, 60% of high school girls experienced persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness in the past year, and nearly 25% of them had made a suicide plan. And I just, I, I just, uh, you know, as I was thinking about this woman's question, and I was thinking about these statistics, this just seems so relevant. Like, how do we find purpose when our soul's been shattered? And clearly finding purpose and a reason to live, a reason to go on is becoming more and more difficult for our teenagers um, and for our 20 somethings. Um, and and it's just so relevant, not only for these mothers that have lost our children, but in my mind, all of us, all of us are impacted by this question. Yeah. What do you think, so, Laura? It's so true. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times that I've shown up in a, a public setting and someone has come up to me and said, my child, you know, my daughter, my son is struggling with mental health. It seems to be everywhere. May is actually mental health month. And so I'm getting so many things in my inbox right now and have this whole entire month. I also think of how many counselors. I have a really great friend, Mary Carroll, who works in the world of helping young people get to their next step. It's called Discover Pathways. So college planning, life planning, things like that. And she's constantly talking to me about I'm not even worrying about where they're going to college. I'm worrying about their mental health. And she does so much counseling with parents mm -hmm. and with loved ones who are so concerned. So I'm glad that you brought all of these statistics to the table. They're horrific statistics. Mm -hmm. And I did listen to that Ezra Klein podcast before this, and it just, it broke my heart. It broke my heart that we are sitting in a mental health crisis like sound the alarms, it's a crisis. Mm -hmm. And it's happening in, you know, we're feeling the effects in families, in schools, in communities, in churches, like, hello, let's just wake up, right? Wake up, America. This is happening. This is real stuff. This is yeah. relevant. And Christine, yeah. I just have to tell you that like the timing of this is crazy because last podcast, podcast number 30, you shared with us how you were taking a whole group of women, 30 women, to Ireland, Northern Ireland. If you want to learn more about that, you can go to our website, soulenchilada.com. And you had said that the tagline of your retreat was waking up to the second part of life, right? Yeah. Second half of life. Yeah. Second yeah. half of life. Well, waking last up to the second half of life. You don't know this, but last week after recording that podcast, I went on a hike with my dog. Everyone loves Henry. I love Henry. Henry. My dog, Henry. <laughs> and love, love Henry. I live in Colorado. We have an enormous amount of smoke coming from Canada right now for wildfires. Mm. So the mm. visibility was very, very low. But I went out anyways, I decided, you know, I got to get some exercise, got to get some stress out of my body. So we go on a hike. I'm thinking about our podcast and I'm mm. thinking she is totally wrong. I call BS, Christine Ruth. <laughs> you are wrong. Hey, I hey. don't, I'm not in the second part of my life. Wake up, wake up call. Okay. Because I turn 54 this summer, 54 mm -hmm. years old. I'm way your senior. I'm way older than you. 
so much older than me, Laura. You are like <laughs> ancient. You're like my wise grandma mentor. Yes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so I'm breaking it down in my head on the trail, you know, getting, calculating the math in my head. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I am not in the second half of my life. I am in the last third. Because mm -hmm. if you take 54 divided in half, I lived 27 years growing up, getting married, getting ready to have a family. Then at 28, I became a parent, three kids, raising kids, like surrendering my life to family and trying to figure out how do you fit in career and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. And now I'm an empty nest getting ready to move into my last 27 years. Mm -hmm. So it's really 33. I think you should change the name of your retreat. 33% mm. of my life is left. If I'm lucky, if I'm blessed by God, right, to live to 81, that may not happen. That's actually older than the average American woman. The average mm. American woman doesn't live to be 81. Okay, set, yeah. set all that math aside. Yeah, yeah. I'm running, I'm contemplating. And I'm like, God, what is the meaning of the last 33% of my life? I mm. want meaning. I mm. want to discover why do I stay on this planet? What mm. is the calling you have upon my life? Yeah. Christine, you're not, you're not going to believe this. Okay, so you're <laughs> contemplating. Okay. okay. The meaning of life. I'm contemplating the meaning of life. Head and in the class. And, and I've shared before, I have Henry on a leash because we've had so many mountain lion attacks, so many dogs that have been taken by mountain lions. So I'm yeah. being diligent. I have him on the leash. And the next thing I know, we round the corner and he jumps high as, as high as he possibly can and starts barking like a crazy dog. Mm -hmm. And I look over where he's barking. It's not a bear. It's not a mountain lion. It's not an elk. It's not a coyote. It's a moose. A oh, moose. God. He is barking at a moose. And I will oh, tell you, God. having lived in the mountains for almost 18 years, I have never come face to face with a moose. So I have no idea what to do. I, ha I have no idea. Terrifying. I have no idea what to do. So I just go into reaction mode, right? The trauma response of fight. And I plant my feet side by side, raise my arms up in the sky and start yelling this guttural scream from down within me. I think all the grief inside of me was like roaring out. And I just yelled, Hey, and you would think that would make the moose back up, right? I, I would be terrified of you. <laughs> yep. The moose ah. charged us. The moose mm -hmm. charged us. He went from 30 feet away Oh my gosh, Laura. To 25 feet away, 20 feet away, 15 feet away, to about nine, nine feet away from me, charging at me. I saw my life flash before me. I thought, this is it. I am going to die by a moose attack. Uh, Never in my wildest dreams. And about nine feet away from me, the moose changed her mind and she jetted off to the left she went across the path and down into the woods. And there I stood with a barking dog shaking from head to toe. Oh my gosh. Gosh, Laura, seriously, seriously, seriously. Moose, I, I got shoot. home. I looked up at this, you know, I looked up at the ceiling and I was like, okay, God, now this is real. What yeah. does a life worth? living look like because my whole life just flashed in front of me and Christine I think that's a call upon this podcast mm -hmm. I think it's the call upon our lives I think every single woman every single person listening to this podcast should mm -hmm. ask themselves that question yeah. what does a life worth living look like yeah. my son decided it wasn't worth it I'm fighting for my daughters. I'm fighting for other youth. I'm fighting for mothers who are so concerned about their daughters and sons, but we need to find it. We need to help women discover young people, middle class, you know, middle-aged, 
older, everyone needs to know what does a life worth living look like? Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Laura, I ha I'm, I I'm, I'm stammering to find a response um, to your story. I mean, first of all, I just want to say you are such a badass that you started screaming <laughs> at that moose because I would have just peed my pants and fallen on the ground. I know I would have, I would have never had that response. And that just tells me that you are some wild and courageous woman. And that's why I love you. And um, way to go. Apparently the moose didn't appreciate it though. Um, you know, I don't know what her problem was, but she was apparently not okay with that. And I am so grateful that, that she changed direction. And I'm sure when she saw you up close, she was like, oh yeah, that's God's girl. Nope. Changing directions. Um, like that's not okay. Um, because as you know, I mean, I was a guide in Montana and we talked a lot about moose and how you never approach them and how they're very dangerous and they can be very aggressive and they will trample you in a heartbeat. They will not only dodge you and trample you. So I am glad you're alive. Can I just say that was real? That's like a real near death kind of experience. And so I'm so grateful that you're not impaled today <laughs> and we are having a 31 episode 31st episode because i had no idea that's crazy yeah it's crazy and, and just oh, yeah. so you know i put it out to my neighbors to like beware there's a vicious moose out there and i have a retired uh, cu professor who lives close by who's an environmentalist and he was like you did everything wrong just so you know if you encounter a moose in the wilderness you do not yell you back up quietly you pretend you're not there and so do not do what i did Ladies, do not do what well, I did. Thanks be to God, I am alive, but do not do what I did. <laughs> Don't do it, Laura did. But it was still really badass. Thank and you. Um, I'll take and, it. Yeah. I'll take it. And, and it's good it. to know because that's like one of those mountain lion things. And I always say, would I? You're supposed to do that with a mountain lion. Right. Make yourself big and start screaming. Um, and I always say I would never have the the, the power to do that. And secondly, I just want to say I'm so touched by your story um, in terms of how it landed for you, in terms of reconnecting you with your purpose and reconnecting you with this notion, this reality that you have 33% of your life left, maybe, right? Uh, same for me. And that part of the reason we're doing this podcast is because both of us have been impacted by depression, um, by suicidal thoughts, um, you know, by my mom's mental health journey I've talked about and suicidality and that it's just such a, uh, a passion for both of us that we need to find a, a reason to live beyond the roles that we inhabit as women, um, that we might be an amazing wife. Um, we might be an incredible mother. Um, we might be an incredible caregiver to our loved ones. We might be an amazing power shark at work. And uh, whatever roles we inhabit as women, beautiful, amazing. And we have to find our why right? Simon Sinek talks about the power of why, and that if we don't have clarity about our power of why, we are all going to face major tests, um, moments of darkness. Uh, we are all going to have dark nights of the soul, where we're going to be sitting in the soup of what makes my life worth living. And a shout out to moms who sit in grief and say, I don't know if I can find a reason to live after this. I, I don't know how I would do it. Uh, and we don't have to, you know, th there's no easy solutions. Um, but what I'm, what I'm struck by, you know, is how 
we have to revisit that sense of purpose. We have to revisit our reason for being over and over in every season of our lives and go, why am I here? And um, what does make my life worth living? I love the way you're phrasing that question. How do we live, make a life worth living? Mm -hmm. um, how do we do that, Laura? Well, I'm, it just dawned on me that a lot of women that I admire and respect are living out a purpose that is connected to their deepest grief, which mm -hmm. I'm sure I, I could say I would never choose this path. I would never pray mm -hmm. to God and ask him, hey, give me this really hard thing so that I can shine a light or be a voice or put an arm around mm -hmm. other women. But that's often how it works. I mean, Kay Warren has been an incredible mentor and beautiful woman of faith that I can try to emulate because she lost mm -hmm. her son to suicide many years ahead of me. And, and there's comfort. We would never want to be in that tribe together, obviously, but I can look to her and it, she gives me hope. I think of women who have endured the dark night of the soul of divorce and they're the best people to walk alongside a woman who's newly divorced. Or mm -hmm. I think about a friend who is walking through breast cancer and all of these other women who are survivors of breast cancer are surrounding her with support. And now they're finding their purpose in, in that, in that tribe, in that circle, mm -hmm. they're finding connection and they're finding community and they're sharing their story. And that makes a beautiful, a beautiful why. I have a friend who kept, um, she had several abortions as a young woman and she kept them in the dark and she kept that she kept her voice silent. And then mm -hmm. she's just had the courage recently to share her journey with her family. And now she's sharing it with her friends and she's getting um, some type of a counseling license so she can help other women who are grieving after abortion. And I think that unfortunately, oftentimes, doesn't our purpose come from mm -hmm. our deepest wounds? Mm -hmm. I think of, of David Kessler. He's a grief specialist. He experienced grief as a young, young boy, and then he lost his son and he's going before me and I'm learning from him. I'll put in the show notes, but I absolutely love this book, Finding Meaning that David Kessler wrote, The Sixth Stage of Grief. And yeah. he talks about the voices in our heads and can mm -hmm. we control those voices and can our minds help us to find meaning? And he says, yes. You do have control. Your thoughts create meaning and meaning guides the story in your mind and the story you tell yourself as well as the story you tell others. I'm healing versus I'm stuck. I will yeah. never live again versus I will live a life to honor my loved one. And that's what I've chosen to do. I want to live a life that honors my son. And one of the funny things about Evan is he, he always said, mom, I've given you enough stories to write at least 10 books <laughs> because I would, I have a, I have a notebook and I would write down all the Evan stories. I'm like, oh, I can't believe you survived that truck accident. You survived the bike accident. You survived, you know, and he, and there was always ways in which God was intervening and things were turning around for him and. And I just said, Evan, you are living this incredible, epic life. And he said, Mom, I've given you enough stories for 10 books. And I said, that's enough. 10 books. If I can write 10 books, then we're good. Yeah. 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 Oh, I love that. I love that. And I love that you brought up that David Kessler book, too, because I, you know, as I was preparing for the retreat, I was thinking about that book. I had read it a while ago and I just love some of the mantras in there. Like one of the things David Kessler says is pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. And, and just speaking to that thing that you just said that life is painful. Yeah. 
I mean, there's no way if we love, if we love anyone, we will feel pain. And the more we love, the more pain we feel, right? And that's what every mother knows that she holds in her heart. Like, you know, this kind of fragility of life and the terror of holding some, some, anything you love, you know, um, but the suffering comes by the story we tell ourselves about the pain. Um, the suffering comes by the story we tell ourselves about who we are. And um, it's so important to be conscious of what stories we're telling ourselves um, about whether our life has meaning or not, and how we're thinking about this chapter of our life, whatever chapter you happen to be. You know, I always invite women to divide their lives into chapters and to give each chapter a title. And I invite them to say, you, you know, think about the fact that we are the protagonist in our own story, you know, and God doesn't write bad stories. God never writes bad stories. And so God's writing a story through you. And, you know, pain is inevitable, but you get to decide uh, how the story ends or the meaning you make of that story. You know, you don't get to decide what happens to you, what circumstances you face, what situations you struggle with, but you do get to decide you have some input in the meaning of your story. And I, I, you know, I love Mary Oliver's quote from her poem. Um, she says, doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Uh, tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. Um, I go back to that Mary Oliver poem all the time, you know, and David Kessler writes in uh, his chapter five on the decision. He says, each of us has a decision to make about how to heal from a loss. Um, and we have to understand that not making a decision is a decision. Healing from our losses doesn't allow for neutrality. It's active. It's not passive. Each of us must decide whether or not we want to live again um, in the face of any loss, um, whether it's the loss of divorce, uh, the loss of identity, uh, the loss of, um, you know, in this case, a child, um, a partner, um, any source of nourishment. Um, each of us has to make a decision about how we're going to live and uh, we need to cast a vote. Uh, you know, is this life going to continue? And if so, what is my why in it? Um, and I appreciate um, that, you know, that, that we need to engage with our grief. We need to engage with the sadness. We need to like swim in the soup sometimes for years. And that's okay. And um, ultimately, there's some sense of choice that we each need to make about how we want to spend, you know, in our case, Laura, the last 33% of our lives or whatever is given to us of this wild and precious life. I agree. We're running out of time, but I just had this last thought. I think this is a podcast that goes beyond our generation. I feel like what we have just shared in the last 28 minutes is something that we could, I can share with my daughters and mm. their friends. And we need to start asking that question very young, very young in life. I'm thinking of my mm. nieces who are 12 and 14 years old. Let's start asking the question now, what mm. does your life worth living look like mm -hmm. and build it, build it strong, build it brave, mm -hmm. build it with a healing mentality because we will never be healed, right? It's action, but we step into the day and we choose the path of healing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Laura, that's a good uh, place I think to end. Um, and we'll come back to this, of course. We always of course. do. 
And that is episode 31 of The Soul Enchilada.